this is a fundamental overhaul of the U.S. tax system. And, and so obviously, U.S. companies are, are much more impacted uh, by this reform, whether it be in the form of the toll charge or, or new rules relating to intercompany payments, CFC regime, et cetera. So, so they are more obviously focused on, on U.S. tax reform and how does it impact their business, et cetera. But not, not to be missed is that we're living in a global uh, economy. And, and so inbound companies investing into the U.S. have to compete with U.S. multinationals. So, so from an inbound perspective, we, I think we need to be aware of how are U.S. multinationals responding to it. What are the opportunities or, or the, the, the risks associated with this tax reform? So what are you seeing in terms of inbound companies trying to st stay up to speed with the U.S. companies or the, the need for, for inbound companies to make sure that they're up to speed with what's going on and the impact on, US, on their U.S. operations or for that matter, the U.S. deal space? So let's talk about this from not only a U.S. inbound and outbound, but let's also even take it to an industry perspective, okay? So um, there is no doubt that many of these provisions seem to hit U.S. outbound companies first and a bit more broadly, although that may also be a bit stereotypical. Mm -hmm. There are also some very large inbound companies. There are some very large Japanese inbounds I can think of that have very complex and large operations in the U.S. where they're likely looking as quickly as they need to at the changes in law as many of the U.S. outbound companies. Uh, that being said, when we think about the way that inbound outbound impacts it, it's more about the size of the business, the complexity of the operations in the U.S., and those that have the greatest complexity and at the same time are also facing some of the more beneficial or challenging parts of this tax reform. They're the ones that are looking at this most closely, right? They need to understand from the business perspective their audit committees are asking questions, their CFOs, their CEOs, their COOs are saying, what does this mean for our business? So I'd say you've got a number of companies, right, that are probably ahead of the game, that have been studying it very closely because it is really about the way that they perform as a business. Um, that probably is a bit of a minority when you consider the whole pool of corporate taxpayers. But you have a number of U.S.-based companies, and then we also have some inbounds that have operations that are so large where they've spent that type of time, and they're really strategizing what that means. The rest are probably, again, in that element of digesting and understanding and modeling what it means. Um, I think it's going to be important that with law now in place, they try to catch up as quickly as possible. Sure. The other thing to think about as we think about inbound versus outbound is to consider industries. So I think it's important that people consider that because it isn't necessarily U.S. versus non-U.S. based in terms of the way companies look at the laws, let's take a few examples of the way industries might be reacting to it. So look at the very asset-intensive industries, whether that's chemical companies, industrial manufacturers, whether that's kind of the retail and consumer businesses or the energy business. Those businesses all tend to be more resource-intensive and capital-intensive. They're looking very closely at these rules. They're probably some of those ones that are also looking more closely at the way it may incentivize the new law in terms of new investment, right? Um, when you think about other parts of the industries that are operating in the U.S., let's think about those that have high value intangible assets. So whether that's, you know, the technology type firms, whether that's the pharmaceutical firms, and, and often those businesses tend to be very multinational. Mm -hmm. Often those outbound companies may have half or more of their business overseas. Sure. And they've also then had a vast mix between how and where they locate their intangible property and where it's been developed. In the prior worldwide. Exactly, in, in the prior system. And so because those companies are often so multinational and they have such a distribution of their businesses on a global basis, they're looking very, very closely. So I mention that because when we think about these base erosion anti-abuse tax provisions or the BEAT, 
it's some of those companies that we believe may be most impacted. And they're then the ones that you can expect have been looking very closely at the impacts of the law and trying to translate and understand what that's going to mean for their businesses. You know, if I were to cover one more industry, it'd probably be the, the real estate industry. And I just call that out because when you think of the interest expense provisions, that is the one place where the interest expense limitations, there'll be an election that they not apply by business. And so that may give those businesses a little bit more latitude in the way they may want to continue, the way they balance their debt versus equity decisions, whereas others that are subject to these earnings stripping rules may need to look more closely at what they'll be able to be most efficient at from a tax perspective. So, Mike, one last question for you. We're still in the first month of this post-tax reform era. How do you see, where do you see the U.S. economy going in the next three to five years? So, I'd say that people are very hopeful about the growth. If I look at it, although I'm not an economist, it's tough for me to make a view from a macroeconomic point of view. Let's just think a little bit about what some of the key elements are when we think of the economy and what you would expect to occur and what we hope to occur. One, I think there is very much a view that we will see substantial continued investment, right? Foreign direct investment in the U.S. has been at a very strong rate over the last few years. We believe that will grow. Um, as we consider the job market, we think that's going to tighten. So we're at some of the lower levels of unemployment that we've had in a long period of time. We think that will tighten further. As we consider GDP, GDP has actually in the last few months been revised upwards slightly. There's a view that we'll get to a point that's somewhere around 3, 3.2%. What do business people hope for? I think they hope that that's something that will continue out three to five years. As you speak to economists, it really depends on their underlying theory of the way they evaluate the economy. But let's just bring it back to let's say companies in the business. I believe we expect a very healthy business environment, one where that economic development will continue, one where we can invest more in technology, innovation, and jobs that will make the U.S. a continuing place to invest in over the long term, not just in three to five years. Thanks, Mike. And as you know, the U.S. remains the largest destination of, of Japanese investment in the world. And so Japanese companies are, are constantly looking at stock deals, asset deals, joint ventures uh, in the U.S. So this U.S. tax reform that we're seeing has a significant impact and will have continue to have a significant impact on Japanese companies. And, and I think that Japanese companies will have to continue monitoring the development of tax reform and how it's impacting and not only inbound companies, but also U.S. multinationals or competitors uh, in the U.S. market. So, so really appreciate uh, your spending time with us today. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Shane. Thanks, Mike.